Really, we really kept this topic very quiet. We did not put ads into any of the newspapers about it um, because we felt it's a very, very, very sensitive topic and it's really the first time that anybody is talking about it in public. So we're kind of keeping it under the radar, um, but we got an amazing opportunity from Representative Schumacher, who was here from Israel, and we figured let's not lose this opportunity because Dina is just Representative Schumacher. Is she, from every perspective, from the perspective of um, Yiddishkeit, spirituality, from the perspective of psychology, from, the, from every perspective, from the perspective of being a mother, a grandmother, a wife, she just has it all, you know? So having Reverend Schumacher here is like having access to somebody who's really very, very, very smart, grounded. We're just very, very happy and we're very honored. And she was in town, so we very quickly said, great, she's here, we're gonna do this. And we must have put this together literally within three days. Thank you, Michal Clara, for having access to the whole world. Um, yeah, it's really wonderful. And it's a special honor to have Representative Reisman here, Representative Landau here, quite a number of representatives. So, um, anything else I should say? I, I have my colleague here, Shana Friedman, from the di executive director of, Sh of Shalom Task Force. And we're both part of, here, you're going to see this, of a coalition of over 40 agencies it's called the United Task Force, that service everything having to do with any mental health issues. It's all agencies. It's, um, oh hell, I moved in. I mean, the whole list is all here. So you just look at the list and go on the website, and if ever you need anything, this is a wonderful resource. So these are gonna be here, we'll give them out later. I don't wanna take an extra minute because Reverend Schumacher is leaving to Israel tonight. So really, we are so grateful that you're here, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Hey. Good evening, everyone. Okay. This is not like the funnest topic I ever spoke about, but I think it's an important one, and we're gonna to try to go in a direction that is empowering and you know, a little bit of um, the ability to think about how to try to help prevent certain issues. Okay, I, I think that in my mind, I'd like to divide into three different categories. One of them is what we're gonna call like the late breakups. You know, couples who are dating for a long time and maybe like about to get engaged and have like a breakup right at that point. Um, then we have the topic of broken engagements. And then we have the very early divorces. Okay, so I think that these topics have something in common. There's certain factors that kind of, you know, are, are applicable to all three, and there are some that are like kind of exclusive to each one. Um, I'd like to preface by saying that in order to make this kind of more productive, I like to talk about um, many years ago, there was a online journal that only kind of lasted for a long time, a short time, called Claw Perspectives. And in 2012, they ran, what they used to do, they would like run like a series on a certain topic and have a lot of people write about it. So um, they ran one um, series on the topic of early divorces in the firm community. And um, I was asked to write, a, write an article on this topic, <laughs> unrelated to our topic, the editor, had a hard time with my writing, so he ended up writing most of the article. <laughs> a lot of his wife actually at one point introduced herself to me and said, I'm, you know, I'm the wife of the guy with the big red pen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh. All right. Um, so, uh, so the ideas, you know, with ideas, the writing was uh, not, not my strong point. Anyway, so um, I entitled my article, Marital Preparation Begins at Age Two. Because what I really would like to focus on is not just talk, to talk about problems, but to talk about solutions to problems, and how we could kind of like a little bit take some preemptive measures to think about how we want to prepare our children for, for marriage and what we could do about it. So um, in that article, I spoke about certain um, skills that we as parents can give our children that could help us with these problems. And maybe, Maybe we'll start with a little bit of um, a little bit of those skills, just to give us like a perspective and how they can help us. Okay, I have to tell you that I was when I was writing that article, I was so talking to myself because some of the things that we do as parents are coming from such a loving, protective place 
but they paradoxically are putting our children at risk um, later on. And a lot of this is based in that very overprotective Jewish mother, um, Jewish parents, and the way we, the messages that we give our children from a very young age about their ability to cope, to solve problems, to, have, to be able to cope with delayed gratification. Um, and these are really the issues that start at a very, very young age. So one of the things that I focused on is the, um, the problem solving skill set. And at a very, very young age, when a child comes to you and says to you, you know, my lollipop fell in the sand or something like that, and you say, oh, come, but we'll take a new one. And then two years later, it's my toy broke. Oh, I'll get you a new one. And then two, la two years later, it's, I don't like that kid sitting next to me in class. And my response is, I'll speak to the mora. And then two years after that, it's, I don't want to, I can't take that test. I have, I, I, it's too hard for me. Oh, I'll speak to the principal. And kind of this is like this pattern, this pervasive pattern that goes where sometimes our kids are teenagers and they're young adults and we are solving a lot of problems for them. I, I'm in the seminary scene in Israel and my seminary uh, is considered more like independent because kids have to cook two meals a day and they have one meal catered. And even so, I think that we're doing a lot of micromanaging but I recently heard that in some seminaries, like literally the seminary buys the shampoo and the soap and the everything for kids, like everything these days, like the messages, they start with us and then we, then, then, then you know, the seminary scene. So we're not really teaching our, we're not really giving the message that I can problem solve, I can cope, I can deal with things that are not perfect. And, and I'd like to say, as I'm beginning to talk about this topic, that like, Anything I'm going to say now cannot be used as a stereotype for understanding, you know, why these relationships don't work out because there are so many factors. And very often, this is part of the problem, we, we hear about something in our community and we kind of get all anxious and we don't really know what the reason was. So all we can do is be proactive and try to take responsibility for any part of it that we can work with. But it's not like we can exactly point to say, oh, that was one of those, you know, like immature, you know, uh, couples, and that was the one that had, you know, the, the more serious issue. We don't, we often don't know. And this is part of the problem. I think that if we start at a very young age, what we can do is we can build our children's resilience. We can build the ability to deal with delayed gratification. Because anything I'm thinking of for a two-year-old, I'm thinking of what it looks like for a 20-year-old. And, you know, delayed gratification we know that Shana Rishona is not an easy time for many couples. And many of our will say that Shana Rishona today continues for a few years as well. So any child who was used to the quick fix, getting the lollipop and the, you know, the mother calling the teacher and getting the permission not to take the test, what are they gonna do when they have a struggle in their relationship? Most struggles actually do not, are not very, very quickly fixed. And I will tell you that uh, a marriage therapist in Rishalayim told me that she had a very young couple who came into therapy because they were very conflicted in the early stages of the relationship. And she said to them, you know, they, they spoke, you know, she met them a few times. And uh, at one point, the, the young husband says to the therapist, so um, what do you think our prognosis is? So she says, well, I think you could, you know, actually be a very strong couple if you're willing to put in the work. So he says to her, well, how long will that work take? And she said, oh, yeah. I'm imagining that it may be a year or two in therapy. And they looked at each other simultaneously. She said it happened in front of her face that if there was a quick fix, they didn't have the patience to be in therapy for long enough to make this relationship work. And again, I'm not saying that that's an indication. We never want to point a finger because some people have the opposite problem. They stay in relationships for way too long and it should have been over earlier. But the idea that in our generation where everything is microwavable and quickly accessible and quick degrees and quick, and quick diets and quick results for everything, processes, relationships, problems are not solved so quickly. 
So when I when when a two year old has to deal with delayed gratification and <clears throat> starts realizing that a lot of problems are solvable but not immediately, so then that's already a precursor for this healthy attitude that you know what good things come to those who wait. And uh, often when you are the one contributing to the process, that, that the real good thing that comes is the building of my own resilience, my own ability to cope. So I think that this is one, one of the many dimensions that we have to think about. And in this article, what I wrote, and I was literally talking to myself, is that I might know that that's true. But if I'm hosting a Shabbos meal for 15 you know, guests, and a child comes complaining that their lollipop fell, I'm the one who wants the instant gratification. Come, Bubba, here, just take it out. Shh, shh, shh. So sometimes we feed into this, not because we even agree hashkopically that things, uh, that we, 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 we agree with delayed gratification, but when you are navigating a busy life, quick fixes are often the way that works for you. And I see it all the time with myself that there's, I, I know, part of my brain is saying, this is the way to handle the situation. The other one's like saying, there's so much going on here right now that I, I, I'm, I'm going to take the quick way out. So these are the little things that we can think about when we think about how to really prepare children and give them the resilience to be able to cope with many things that will take effort and time before they see results. In fact, um, I, uh, I give a workshop on decision making. And um, there is like a lot of research that's done in choice theory that talks about like universal pitfalls in decision making. Like, and, and, and the, the basic concept is that very often a person has like a choice that they know is right for them, but they're very tempted by the other option. And that's what creates the tension around the decision making is should I do this or should I do that? So if you wake them up during the night and say, which, which, which decision do you think is best for you? They know. So then why are they grappling with the other option? So there are six, it's not our topic for tonight, it's an interesting topic to think about, but there's <coughs> universally six different um, factors that kind of pull people against options that are good for them. And one of them is instant gratification. If the, if the choice that I know is best for me is going to take a long time, I may opt for the one that I know my brain is not as good for me, but it will get quicker results. And the classic example would be weight loss. I mean, most of us know by now that, you know, the Weight Watchers type diet that, that takes off a little bit of weight over a long amount of time is the healthiest, most likely to keep the weight off. And why are people spending billions of dollars on all these fad diets that have not been proven? Because anything that promises to get you to your goal weight in two weeks instead of two years, we're, we're in. I may lose the weight and lose my hair and lose my body mass and my bones, but I'll do it. And that's just one, one of the many examples. So therefore, when it comes to relationships and problem solving in life, there aren't that many quick fixes. And this, I think, really contributes to, to understanding this problem. Okay, let's look a little further. Self-regulation. I remember hearing from Rabbi Dr. Torsky so some things that I learned from him just kind of stay with me all the time. And one of the things that he says is that the biggest gift that you can give your child is a toolbox for self-regulation. And the self-regulation toolbox is not rocket science. It's usually things that are <coughs> as simple as music, water, exercise, meditation, acts of kindness, all kinds of things. Daniel Goldman in his book, Emotional Intelligence, he gives lists of things that are really not rocket science. But the irony, and this is so ironic, is that many of us, forget about the kids, even us as adults, we live, we are at the mercy of our emotions. We get very, very, very overwhelmed by something. And we really don't know how to regulate. And my toolbox is right next to me, and I don't think about, about turning to it. Many of us, we equate regulation with fix my problem and then I'll regulate. If I could quit the job, then I'll calm down. Can you so, define what self-regulation means? It means the ability to bring your emotions back to, when you have like what we call like an emotional hijack, where you kind of, there's something called subjective units of distress. So if I ask you between a zero and a 10, how do you feel right now? And I'm like a nine, because something at my job is just so annoying. 
So many people will quit their job or walk out and stomp out and get fired because of the way they handle the situation. But if I took a hot shower or took a walk or listened to music, I may be able to calm down and then think about how I want to solve my problem. I always say the best example in Torah of poor self-regulation is Ahasuerus. He gets very, very triggered by his wife. And the only way to solve the problem is to kill her. And then the next day he wakes up, and we don't have a measure that says this, but I imagine he probably said, where's my beautiful wife? And maybe somebody said, well, if you would have taken a half hour jog, maybe she'd be alive today. <laughs> Good for us Jews that she was not, but that was not great self-regulatory skills. But you understand why people live this way, because if every time the child is crying that the lollipop broke, he gets a new lollipop. And every time he doesn't want to do his homework, he gets a note for the teacher. So then why should he think that there are other ways to regulate? You fix my crap while I calm down. That's the only tool in my box. And then we see that there are things that are not so easily fixable. And adults live, as we all know, we live alongside problems that go on for days or weeks or years. And we're going to just be regulated, like dysregulated until the problem is solved. So the idea of being able to actually like do something to calm myself while I try to solve the problem, or while I have to wait till I solve the problem, is something that should be very obvious. But it's not obvious to many people. We're, we really live at the mercy of our of our emotions. Um, I will even say, <coughs> to go back to like the breakups. There is somebody who writes. A, there's a premarital um, therapist in in Yerushalayim by the name of Rosie Einhorn. She's written a few books about marriage. And she told me, I don't even know if she wrote it in her book, she told me that one night she woke up and she had this statement that I've used many times with my students. She said, your emotional state at any given time is not an indication of the quality of the relationship. Meaning, you're dating somebody and you wake up very nervous. And you're thinking, well, if he's such a great guy, I shouldn't be nervous. Or you wake up and you're kind of feeling a little down. And you're thinking, I'm supposed to be on a high if I'm dating this person. So a lot of people, and I, this is why I've used her this, this expression so many times, a lot of people break off relationships because they just are not in a good mood. But what she's teaching you is that your emotional state is not an indication of the quality of the relationship. Meaning, you could be at a certain cycle of the month, and that's where you're feeling low. Do you know that I had a student who told me that she suddenly realized that she always breaks up with people at a certain time of the month? Because she suddenly feels, I'm not happy with him, but I really have nothing to do with him. So when we learn to regulate and then look at the problem, I'm not saying that it's never an indication of the quality of the relationship, but it's definitely not necessarily an indication. So first I regulate, and then I examine how much of this is about this boy, and how much of this could be something else that's going on in my life, or even anxiety about the state of life, or making a big decision, but it's not about him. And this would, you know, this definitely contributes to our understanding of, of the problems. So Rabbi Dr. Torsky says, the best gift you can give your child from a very young age, and I'll say that the child in us also needs this, is the awareness of what what do I have? What are my skills for regulating? And I think he recommends that even you know, when you talk to a young baby who's crying, you could say, oh, you know, you're so upset right now, and we're going to turn on the music because that's going to help you. Well, let's go you know, call grandma, let's, let's bake cookies, or let's turn on the music. It's just um, it, whatever you're going to do, but the child hears you saying from a very young age that there are things that can be done Without fixing the problem, I can help you regulate. He gives this example of, you know, so typically like a child gets a doll, you know, for her birthday from her grandmother, and then the next, you know, the, the sister is all jealous and she starts crying. And you start kind of figuring out, maybe we'll ask grandma to bring you your doll early for your birthday, maybe. But that is very poor skills. You're upset. It's really disappointing when someone has something and you help them name the emotion if they're feeling jealous or whatever they're feeling. And you know what? Let's turn on the music and dance a little bit. Maybe you'll feel a little better after that. So the child starts connecting in their mind that I may not get what I want, but I can still calm down. And that becomes part of their self-regulation. Okay. Um, if we kind of zoom forward a little bit towards the stage of the dating itself, 
I think that part of the resilience and the problem solving is um, exasperated by our societal involvement in our children's dating. And here I know I'm getting a little controversial. But how much of the shit up process is micromanaged by parents? Everything from the parent writing the child's resume. I believe that if a child is old enough to date, they're old enough to create their own wish list and their own resume. And when a parent writes a resume for a child, it's the parent's wish list that's coming into that. And I think that, you know, let the child sit there and divide between what I call their wants and their needs, their, the negotiables and the non-negotiables and to like really kind of create their own resume. It's about them. And then again, I know this is controversial and I know that I'm not gonna change the world, but even the shit off process in terms of who communicates with the shotgun, you know, we have a concept called triangulation. And triangles, triangulation always is not good for the dyadic connection. So here's this young, nice young man who's dating this young, nice girl instead of them communicating with each other, they're communicating through the shotgun. So we're creating a triangulated relationship where they actually don't even have to face each other to see whether they had a good time or they didn't have a good time or what went well. In fact, what I call it a triangle, I think it's more like a pentagon. <laughs> it's like the boy, his mother, the girl, her mother, and the shotgun. Shoo. Lots of room for misinterpretation. And we want this couple to have good communication, but we're micromanaging the process. And I kind of feel like a lot of things get lost in translation also. You know, the child to the parent, the parent to the child, from the child to the other parent. I mean, how accurate is that information? And again, I feel if the child, if the child, I don't even want to call them a child, but if the young adult is old enough to get married, they should be old enough to communicate how they felt about, about the date. So the more we could kind of take out all the parties and let them face each other, and let's even say that you know there's an advantage of having a shahan in the, in the in the picture. So, but why can't the dater speak to the shahan about the date? I find myself I'm not a, I'm not a shahan, but every so often I'm involved in a, in a shidduch, and I find that you get the most generic responses from parents. Oh, she had a good time. Can you elaborate? Oh, he, uh, you know, he thought she was smart and pretty. Okay, that's nice. Can you tell me anything else? Like, you know, like it's just like it's it's kind of like lost in all the in all the translation. So this is part of the skill sets that we want to give people to communicate, to communicate directly, to have to be able to articulate their own emotions, and then to move me out of the picture. When I go a little further, even when the couple gets engaged, we we developed so many societal um, like the etiquette of, of, of the buying the gifts. So gifts are bought, bought to create a sense of closeness. So when the future mother-in-law picks the bracelet, so this she's not marrying the girl. He is. So why can't the couple shop together for the jewelry? Why can't he pick something? This is supposed to be a, a, a display of affection. And it's it's kind of being micromanaged by, by, by family. Proximity, where they live, and proximity to the parents. You know, and, and where I where I live, it's culturally very acceptable for the young couple to be hosted one week by one side and one week by the other side. And in theory, this is helping the couple because they work hard during the week and they don't have that much money, so they come to my house for Shabbos. They can raid my refrigerator. It's all great, except. What young couple wants to live under the observing eyes week after week? The guy got married to never make his own kiddush and never have his own zmiros because he's always somewhere. I happen to think that the American couples who start out in Israel, there's a lot said about this, a lot written in Mishpacha magazine, a lot of criticism. <laughs> Mitla, what is it called? Uh, is that what, I forgot what the series is called. There's a whole series now about Ramad Shkol. I don't read it, but I hear about it. I live right near. What's that? Growth curve. Growth curve. Um, the one advantage that I think that they have is that they actually can start off their marriages without being under their parents' um, you know, scrutinizing eyes all the time. <coughs> so in that sense, they're, they're better off than my kids who kind of come to me for Shabbos but don't get any privacy. 
So there's a lot of factors, some of them are cultural, that really, we're not really helping this, this couple stand on their own two feet. And again, we're not gonna change everything in our society. But if we can kind of like a little bit give a little bit of space, oh no, we don't have to break the conventions, but a little bit of the processing, of the involvement, of the owning of the process, I think could be helpful. Okay. I'd like to talk a little bit about the specifics in what we're talking about. Okay, so first of all, the late breakups. What's going on with the late breakups? So I'd like to say that I think that anxiety is a very, very big factor that plays a very big role in all the stages. Often, the couple start dating because of somebody's anxiety. Meaning, girl right home from seminary, not necessarily sure she's ready, but everybody says there's a shidduch crisis. The second you put the word crisis next to the word shidduch, you are creating shidduch anxiety. And I have 17-year-old students who come to Israel for the year, and they're already anxious. And I say, Bogolo, you're not in crisis. You're 17 years old. But they think they're in crisis because there's a crisis. So often, the drive to start dating is a feeling of anxiety, which is never a good place to start. I had this you know, cute anecdote from many years ago. I had a student who was in Israel for the year, and she came from an out-of-town community, and her family moved to New York while she was in seminary. She came home to a new home in New York, and she went to show with her mother right, right home from seminary. And somebody from the new community in New York approaches the mother after show and says, oh, you have such a lovely daughter. What is she looking for in Shittachem? And the mother says, um, oh, you know, she's not starting to date yet. So the New York mother puts her arm on the shoulder of the out-of-town mother, said, I know you're new here in town. So let me just share with you that the shelf life of girls in New York is very short. So the mother says back, the out-of-town mother, she says, oh, really? I'm so happy you're telling me because I'm not so concerned. We preserve her very, very well. <laughs> I thought that was like a great <laughs> comeback. But if this is, are the messages that our kids are getting, then there's a lot of anxiety fueling this process. So we need to keep the anxiety down. We need to make our homes a safe haven. And I, I, I think about this so much because I, I, I give value on the topic of Bitachon. Nowhere is it, is it as clear that Hashem runs the show. He runs the show everywhere in our lives. But the Gemara clearly says, Bas Ploni Uploni. And we are, we have a system which is created for from people, but it's not very bitachon focused. And therefore we do a lot of the cause effect things. If you have this, you get that. If you don't have this, you will not get that. And I keep thinking to myself, like, boss pony the pony. I, I, I tell like this to my students because in order to, I'm not so humorous, but in order to like reduce anxiety, I kind of like give them, try to give them a humorous, you know. So when someone <laughs> says to you, oh, you're not gonna get a shit up because of whatever, I said, right, imagine Shemaim, Hashem is like navigating all the ponies, and a malach kind of tactfully taps Hashem on the shoulder to the and says, Hashem, she doesn't have straight hair. Oh, thank you, malach, not that plony, that plony. Okay, let's shift all the plonies now. Let's move them all around. So I, I like my, my students to laugh about this because when Roshan navigates things, he, you know, we, we're going to have to stay very, very strong because otherwise we're very, very, very anxiety driven. So the start of the process often is based in anxiety. And then we have <coughs> the fact that very often at some advanced stage in the dating, there is a certain kind of very anxious energy around <coughs> making a decision. And I'm not even talking now about culturally how long we date. That's its own topic, which is its own very complicated reality of how much time people need and how much time the system allows them. And I'm not going to go there because it's very culturally sensitive. But assuming that the couple has <coughs> known each other a nice amount of time. So we have, I get many, many phone calls at a point where I pick up the phone and somebody's hyperventilating on the other side. And she knows that he's about to propose and she is very, very nervous. And I always say, that there's two manifestations of that nervousness. 
there is something called binding the anxiety. Binding anxiety means that there's a free-floating anxiety around making such an important decision. And sometimes the psyche is very unsophisticated. I know he's great. I know he's wonderful. I'm just very nervous to make a life commitment. And sometimes it's a little more sophisticated than that. You know, I used to think, I thought he was smart enough. But all of a sudden, I'm thinking he's not that smart. Or I was attracted to him the first few dates, but all of a sudden he's really not so attracted to me. And that's what we call binding the anxiety. I mean, there's something that becomes the, the issue, which is kind of like holding together the fact that really I'm nervous about the commitment. And I often try to look at it as like, if there's no history with this, if you thought he was good looking, you know, for the first bunch of dates, and all of a sudden he's making you nauseous, or maybe making the decision is making you nauseous. Did you want to ask him? Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I think that attraction, when a person is very, very nervous, it's hard to be attracted. And therefore, like, there's a certain kind of relaxed, uh, in order to connect well, there has to be like a relaxed energy. And when you're making such a big decision, it's really hard to be that relaxed. So sometimes the attraction things also become very, very confused and complicated. Um, I, I remember once a student many years ago who called me and she was hyperventilating. And she says, he's, you know, I think he's gonna propose soon. And I said to her, how do you feel? Just describe to me, I don't understand. She said, I feel like I'm standing at the edge of a cliff. And if I take one step in the wrong direction, I can either fall and die or be safe. So I think I'm just not gonna move anywhere. I'm just paralyzed. And I was so happy that she gave me that imagery because I think that the polarization of the option <coughs> itself creates tremendous anxiety. If you're either making the worst mistake in your life or else you're gonna be in happy never, never land forever and ever, well, anything that's that polarized, it's very hard to move. So you may just stand at the edge of the cliff, blindfolded, and not go anywhere. And the bottom line is that we believe that the, the decision of who to marry is an important piece in the decision. But the other piece is these small little increments of every single day and the amount of effort I put into my relationship. That's what kind of accumulates to a good choice or not good choice. So this like polarization of I either want to go right or wrong really makes it very, very hard for somebody to make a decision. I always, um, I always say that Bacharot or Bachar, the, the, the young adulthood, shares the same shorish as the word Bechira. Because young adults make the most important decisions they're gonna make. Marriage choices, career, community. And they're still that young, they're so young. And Hashem set up the world this way. So clearly he doesn't expect us to make our decisions based on a lot of life experience. Because if he did, we would choose a husband at 50 and a career at 60 and a house at 70. So he wants us to do the best we can with the limited experience that we have. And I kind of find that's empowering because if it's all up to me, it's very, very overwhelming. But if you know I contribute and Hashem controls, one of my big beautiful on things. And I just have to do the best I, I can, but Hashem is kind of leading me in a certain direction as well. Okay. We have a lot more to say here, so I don't want to like over over um, emphasize. I want to say that the um, a common factor for the late breakups, the broken engagements, and the early marriages is a very complicated factor related to infatuation. <clears throat> Infatuation is that very strong pull that people have. I always say to my students, if you think he is Mashiach and Prince Charming wrapped up in one, you're probably infatuated. And that state, clinically, they say that it lasts anywhere between a few minutes and four years. And I don't really know anybody who's infatuated for four years, but that's a long time. Now, when I teach the newly married ladies in Arze and Malodachna, I can see in their eyes if infatuation has worn off or not. Because when they're infatuated, they're often not coming to a share on Shalom Bayes. 
because he's pretty charming. I mean, like, you know, Abishel, like, what could be wrong? <laughs> when they look like they're kind of beginning to sweat, you know that the infatuation is worn off. Now, in the secular world, that's where people say we're not in love anymore, and they break up. By us, we're often married, and it's where the real work starts. The real Ava is based on giving. But when a person's in an infatuated state, it's very easy for them to make a commitment. Because I'll teach us two very important things. But we have a Pasuk. Shlomo Melech says, I'll call Peshayim Tachas Ava. That love covers all blemishes. Now, real love takes a while to reach. But when a person feels a very strong emotional feeling, they're not necessarily focusing on the blemishes. But Chazal teaches Ava Mikal Keles is a sure. But Ava ruins the logic. Most of us don't want to make a commitment to a job for a year because that seems like a long time. A hundred year commitment is a long time. So how does anybody make a hundred year commitment? Because they are, they have an emotional pull towards the other person. <laughs> so they made the commitment with a very strong emotional pull. And then when that wears off and the real Ava is gonna be worked on, and the real Ava kind of is, is, is the beautiful thing that we're striving for. But that's when all of a sudden everyone starts sweating. So the question is, when does that happen? Does that happen? In a late stage of dating, you can still get out. And engagement, for many people, also they still can get out. And in the early marriage, it just means that you have to be very mature to work and to believe in the potential of this relationship. So when you have a young person who is used to problems being solved, doesn't have great skills for, skills for self-regulation, and the infatuation is worn off, and the big, the big poofy dress with all the parties are not happening anymore. So we're left with a lot of maturity is going to be necessary. A lot of resilience, grit, all the things that don't come so easy. And this is, this is like, so I think that even as recently as maybe 20 years ago, people knew they had to work hard. But as the world is moving in a certain direction, the willingness to work hard is definitely, you know, going down. And then you have these couples who look at each other and they say, we don't, we don't want to put in the work. So I am by no means saying that all marriages that don't work out are because of the immaturity of the couple. But I'm saying societally, our children are getting married very young, not with a lot of resilience, and expected to do a lot of problem solving on their own. And now we get back to the point that we mentioned before, which is that if the parent has kind of always been fixing problems everywhere from two all the way through buying the couch and making sure that it fits into the room nicely in the apartment that's two blocks away from them, and then all of a sudden they get married and, okay, shh, don't tell me about your problems. So sometimes kids overconfide and expect their parents to solve their problems, and that's a problem. And sometimes they're just left on their own with no problem-solving skills. So this is a societal issue that we want to work on developing the resilience, the problem-solving skills, the self-regulation, and the ability to really um, work hard towards a goal that's really, really important. Okay. I think that um, I think that part of the issue that we have is when we look at the different things that are going on, we're going to throw a factor into this challenge that's going to make it much more complicated right now, which is the emotional health issues. And here we have all kinds of emotional health issues that are very, very prevalent in today's society. Anxiety and depression are becoming incredibly prevalent, very, very prevalent. Especially post-COVID, you see like a, a, a massive amount of young adults who struggle with anxiety and depression. And then we have some more serious things like personality disorders and um, sexual orientation issues. And you know some of these young marriages that dissipate 
You know, we have to be so careful. Because you can point a finger and say, oh, entitled, young, you know, uh, not willing to work. But some of these couples are really facing very, very serious issues. And sometimes, they're not going to tell you this, but their rabbanim and their therapist said to them to leave the marriage. So we have to be very careful because we have a societal issue that people are not willing to work hard. And then we have some very legitimate reasons why marriages sometimes don't work out. And we have to really be able to not judge and to realize that this is part of what's going on. So what can we as parents do in terms of the emotional health issues? So I'd like to say that I think that something that's hard for us in our community, and it's get, this, this, this topic I think is actually getting better, is the ability to take responsibility and help children get the help that they need at a young age. And when I talk about emotional health issues, I divide it into three categories. The emotional health issues that were owned by the family, by the, by the child, <clears throat> that were diagnosed, that followed professional intervention, and that are holding in a very good place when the child starts dating. And when my students say to me, you know, he's been in therapy, I say, you know what? That's not necessarily a bad thing at all. That might show a lot of ability to own his own issues, maturity, self-awareness, grit. Sounds good. One woman I know says so she wants to make it a, a, a condition that her son should only go out with girls who've been in therapy. <laughs> so obviously we have to understand you know, what went on and, 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 and make sure that things are in a good place. But when a positive person actually owns the issues and works on it, they're just increasing their child's ability to cope well. And you also know, I always tell my students that when you're dating, ask the boy if, if we had some kind of issue to deal with, whether it's between us or with a child, would you, be, would you be open to getting help? And you know that somebody like that, the answer is yes, because they've been through this process and they know that it exists. And that means that they're going with an extra tool in their tool. <coughs> it means, you know, professional help. Then we have the issues which are not diagnosed and not taken care of. And some of those intentionally, and some of those just because of the ignorance of the parent. You know, sometimes, depending on many, many factors, we may be living with a child who's struggling with something, and just always have considered him a difficult child, or the type who's all over the place, so all the cliches that we use. And we never even realized that there was something going on. So I feel that this is not something that necessarily we can do something about, but I feel that teachers and schools have to really, really um, educate their staff towards noticing problems, and working on getting children help. Because sometimes an insightful teacher will pick up anxiety or pick up something, and you know, then they have to convince the parents to get the help. That's you know, a separate issue. But somebody's got to be able to say that this has to get taken care of. And sometimes what happens is, is that when a problem is swept under the rug because it's not good for Shidduchim, I always think that the saddest thing here is that when the problem is swept under the rug, because you want to help the child in Shittuchim, you end up actually doing him the biggest disservice because you increase the chances that that marriage will not succeed. And the best thing we could do for our children is get them hope, help at an earlier stage. And when I say that, I think that in this area, our society is getting better. I think that the stigmatization around therapy has definitely gone down over the years. And even of medication, Really, really, Baruch Hashem, that you know people get the help that they need more. So, but still, some of us have all kinds of cultural messages about you know about help, but we have to realize that you're just doing the child a favor by just like kind of you know do it, taking care of these things before the child enters Shidduch. I've been involved with at least I'm trying to remember if it was two or three Shidduchim where there was a broken engagement not because of the emotional issue of one of the parties, but because of the, of the dishonesty around the emotional issue. 
I remember a certain boy saying to me, if she would have come to me on the date and said to me, I struggle with depression, I'm being treated for something, I would have been okay. But the fact that she hid it from me, I, I can't go for it. And we know that the Gemara says, Chot Moshe HaKadosh Baruch Hu Amas. Hashem's stamp is truth. We want to be truthful. And if you really believe, Bas Ploni Ploni, then you believe that you will never lose by being honest. I say to my students sometimes when they say, you know, I'm being treated for this, I'm being treated for that. I have a certain line that I like to use these days. I say, some boy may say no to you because of that. But the boy will never say no to you because of that. Hashem knows exactly what your pekala is as a plony. And when he said, Bas Ploni the Ploni, there's somebody out there who will accept you with your whole picture. <coughs> and therefore, the dishonesty is just kind of like, it's almost like not believing that Hashem is really running the world. So the idea of early intervention and taking care of things before someone starts Shidduchim and developing a culture where we are not afraid of the stigmatization. Because Hashem is not stigmatizing anybody. But if we as a culture can, just, can accept that, you know, I remember once Dr. David Pelkowitz came to speak to our staff in Nechala many years ago. And he was talking about Rapo Yerapeh, Mikan Shedetna Rishut Lerufim Lerapot. Hashem says, you're allowed to go to doctors. Hashem created a maka, and he created a refor for the maka. He created depression, and he created SSRIs, he created anxiety, he created... And some people on the staff were fighting with him. And I remember he said to a certain Rav, he said, if your child had strep or an ear infection, would you ever say, well, we don't believe in treating? He said, a lot of things that are in the body that are chemical are the same thing as high blood pressure or diabetes or something else. It's, a, it's something that the child didn't choose. And why wouldn't you treat it if you treat other things? So as a society, we're getting better. But a decent amount of these failed marriages or you know traumatic breakups have to do with ambivalence that we have towards diagnosing and treating different types of problems. So the more we can you know, own that and really believe that Hashem is not going to hold it against us, the, the better off our children are. Okay. Oh boy. Okay. Ah, oh, there's more. <laughs> okay. I think that part of the issue that we have right now with the, with the broken engagements, and even with the early divorces, but I think this, this is prevalent most of the broken engagements, it's so interesting. Anxiety is what fuels people to start dating, sometimes prematurely. And then anxiety is also what fuels the breakup. So what happens is something <coughs> starts going wrong in the relationship. And then we have what I call, what Daniel Kahneman calls, the availability heuristic. I have a neighbor with a broken engagement. I have a cousin with a broken engagement. And you know what? Those are great people. So maybe they know something I don't know. And then comes the first fight, or the tension with the parents. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, it's happening to me. It's happening, it's happening, it's happening. And we are perpetuating a cycle of anxiety, where it's, uh-oh, get out now. There's something about engagement which is very difficult. A commitment has been made, but, the, but it hasn't been glued. And therefore, there's sometimes this almost this reverse psychology of feeling trapped. And students sometimes tell me that they kind of take out that magnifying glass. This is my last chance to kind of like, you know, do a whole like, you know, whole check on him. And uh-oh, I don't like the way he talks to this one. I don't like the way he does this. And then comes the anxiety. And we're living in a world today with too much information. You know, my father was a rev of a community when I was growing up, and he knew of one, fa one family with a divorce and one family where somebody had died of a sickness. Today, we're living in the global community of 8 billion people, and boy, every problem in the world is happening every day to everybody. Your Tehillim list is growing longer and longer, and everybody is in trouble. So that kind of perpetuates this feeling of, oh no, it's happening to me. And the bottom line is, percentage-wise, 
Nobody's writing articles in the Jewish magazines about somebody who wakes up in the morning and has a nice day. <laughs> it's kind of boring. So you're reading about problems, you're hearing about problems, and then, uh-oh, this is happening. And I think that a lot of this get out, get out quick, get out before there's children, get out before there's commitment, get out, is really part of, you know, part of what goes on here. Okay. Let's not just talk about problems. Let's try to like also talk about solutions, and I'll take a few questions. Okay. Good communication skills. To get children, even from a very young age, with these books that talk about um, articulating emotion, even just naming an emotion. Because we have like a few, three or four that we know, but there's all kinds of nuances in articulating emotion. Validating a child's experience. Sarah Hadaradikov writes that when a child comes up upset, comes home upset, and you just right away muster him, like, oh, people are starving in Africa, why are you complaining about your whatever, whatever. Like, we kind of like shut down the communication, we shut down the emotional regulation, we shut down the validation. And if we can feel more comfortable discussing emotion, I had something really interesting with one of my children. I had a child who was very afraid of going to the dentist at a very young age. And I tried to do some kind of like, you know, cognitive, you know, work with him. So I made like a chart and I made like, you know, the situation, going to the dentist, and then the emotion, and then the, you know, how can we solve this problem? Now what was interesting, and this is my, you know, kind of micromanaging, even as I was helping teaching him, I wrote down, the problem, and I wrote down the emotion. I wanted him to write down the solution. So I wrote, I had a, a, a picture of him in a dentist chair, and then I wrote, Ani mefachet, my children speak Hebrew, Ani mefachet. He was around five years old. He looks at me, says to me, Ani mm -hmm. bayesh. I'm like, ooh. He was afraid of losing control in the dentist chair. And his feeling was busha, was embarrassment. He happens to have a high pain tolerance threshold. He wasn't scared of the pain. He was scared of the loss of control. But I misdiagnosed that one. I said, this is fear. And it was really embarrassment. So I said to myself, sometimes we just think we know what our loved ones feel. And we don't even let them articulate what they're actually feeling. So the more communication, the more vulnerability, you know, we live in a society where we present our perfect lives with our perfect pictures. Real relationships require so much vulnerability. Somebody sees you in your imperfect look with your imperfect mood, and that alone just makes it so hard for people. We need to be able to face our imperfections. And we as parents need to model that imperfection. You don't have to be perfect. A certain professional once said to me that I should that my that my child thinks I'm too perfect. I'm, I started laughing. I'm like, I don't think it's perfect, but the child thinks you're perfect. So you know what? Bake a cake. He says to me, let it over bake a little bit, get a little burnt, and serve it anyway. It's good for them to see. I'm like, that's not my problem. All my cakes are burnt. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea of being able to model imperfection, because they're going to have to face an imperfect life. And just the fact that this person is looking at me and sees my imperfections, that itself could be so, so dysregulating for a, young, for a young couple. Okay, we want to talk about emotions. I will say one last point and then we'll wind down. Conflict resolution. So important. John Gottman in the 1990s um, did a big study on, um, I think, maybe thousands of families. And he asked a lot of questions about things that go on in people's relationships. And then he asked them to report their level of marital satisfaction. And he tried to find correlations. So he asked the question, do you uh, and your spouse have a lot of perpetual issues in your relationship? He defined a perpetual issue as being not just like this one-time disagreement, but it's like you're a morning person, I'm a night person, or that we disagree, we have very different attitudes towards money or very different attitudes towards family, you know, relationships, you know. So these are things that are going to like, they're going to be, they're going to come up often. That's a perpetual issue. 
he expected to find that the larger number of perpetual issues, the less marital satisfaction, it would make sense if we're arguing about 15 different things. He actually found no correlation between the number of perpetual issues and the level of marital satisfaction. So what, in, in a deeper study, he found out that the system of communication around the issues was much more important than the amount of issues this couple had. They could have 10 different, they disagree about religion, they disagree about money, but if they have a good system for working out their, for discussing their issues, then that discussion could even bring them closer. They could have one perpetual issue that he leaves his socks on the floor, but if they don't know how to communicate about it, they could cause a lot of damage in their relationship. And in the closer study, they found one word that was a big indication of the marital satisfaction. It was called escalation or de-escalation. Escalation is, they're really talking about something that's kind of basic, but they get heated and it gets worse and worse and worse. And then at the top of this like heated thing, they're calling each other names and they're saying damaging things. Not that this doesn't happen and can't be corrected, but if this is the style. So he says the ability to de-escalate was the most important factor in determining the long-term success with this couple. What does it mean to de-escalate? De-escalate means it's getting kind of hot in this room and we're kind of getting a little mean with what we're saying. If you've ever been in an argument with a person and then there was a knock at the front door and you just walked out for a second to open the door to get the neighbor something they needed. When you come back in, to the room, you don't say, where were we? <laughs> By nature, you've already de-escalated because of that little exit. John Gottman says that we have to learn how to de-escalate. If it's getting hot, you say, I'm just going to open the window for a second, or I'm going to pour a drink, would you like one? Or I'll be back in, this, in a second. It's ridiculously simple. But when you de-escalate, you don't get to that like mudslinging, ugly, type of communication. So when we teach our children how to regulate in general, and specifically how to de-escalate in an argument, we're really teaching them skills that will help them later. The last point, which I feel bad to just mention it because it's long and then we're not gonna have time to discuss it. Um, but I'll, I'll give you a reference for this. Um, Susan Heitler is a, a very big um, conflict resolution expert. She happens to be Jewish. I actually heard her speak in Yerushalayim. Um, she wrote a book called From Conflict to Resolution. She wrote another book called The Power of Two. But it's an old, it's an, not an old book, but also I think from around the time of John Gottman, like the 1990s, maybe 2000, something. <laughs> from Conflict to Resolution. She writes in her book that there's five different styles of conflict resolution, and people usually have a prevalent style that they use. I'll just mention in one sentence, there's an aggressive style where you steamroll the other party. There's a passive style where you just back off and say, okay, okay, we'll do it your way. By the way, is not Vitor. Vitor is a gift when I choose from a, from a empowered place to do something for you as a gift. It's not the same as when my self-esteem makes me a yes man. Very, very big mistake that people make. Vitor is when I give you a gift. The gift is given with a good feeling and it's received with a good feeling. Okay, 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 we'll do it your way. It's not a gift. And we have to make a distinction between a passive style of, of, of resolving conflict and between vetoing. It's not the same thing. <coughs> the third style is freeze or an immobilized style, where every time they start arguing about something, they just like kind of like, somebody has to go to Mariv or you know, I have to take a phone call and they kind of never resolve their issues. Number four is what's called flee. And flee is some kind of obsessive behavior that comes to hide the issue. In fact, a lot of addiction therapists ask themselves, what conflict is this person running away from that made them run into whatever addictive patterns they have? So those are four styles that people use that are really not healthy for relationships. The fifth style is called win-win. The win-win is, I could talk about win-win for an hour, but win-win is really where the couple hear each other out. 
they align themselves against the issue. It's not me against you. It's me and you against the issue. And this itself can save a marriage. Because when you're, there's going to be tension. Every relationship has points of contention. But if it's me against you, that's a problem. If it's me and you against the problem, and it has its own style, maybe at some point we'll talk about this more. But I would like a solution that makes you happy and me happy. So we're together finding a way to, to do this. And there's all kinds of, you know, styles of resolution that are win-win. But just the fact that it's the energy is like a, you know, is a, is a synergistic energy. That alone can make it actually even pleasant to figure out where we're going for Pesach. Instead of us killing each other over where we're going for Pesach. So for those who want more information on this, Susan Heitler's book, she talks about it at length. These are things that we could start with our children now. So I think that owning the emotional health issues, working on the problem solving, resilience, emotional communication, self-regulation, conflict resolution, these are all things that we can do in an empowered way to help ourselves bring the best possible outcome for our, for our children in relationships. Okay. Are we taking questions now? What are we doing? If you have time, it would be amazing. What do you say, my uh, Michal? Five minutes, okay, she's my... Uh, and then um, I would love to hear, I think Dr. Friedman, who's Executive Director at Shalom Task Force, also could add on if people have time to stay. Um, she's brilliant. And I was also gonna add on something completely from a different vein. No, no, you're, you're, you're catching a plane, I'm not. <laughs> okay, so any so questions directed towards me right now, and then we'll, we'll have everybody else take over. Yeah, yes. I have a question. Um, I heard a few times in this year recently that the boss cloning or cloning thing, like Big Ravon will say, that's not something we go by today. And furthermore, how does that tie in with the concept that people have multiple zikuga? people have a chance to give up their zivug and, and have another opportunity later or possibly not have an opportunity. How does this tie into what you share with your students? Okay. I don't deal with those with mystical concepts. In fact, it's very interesting that Bas Pony or Pony, we know that Hashem does Bas Pony Pony, but it's also information that I'll never have access to. It's not like you can wake up one morning married and your Shabrach and say, you got it, Pony, you know, you got him. It's so interesting that other than maybe Yitzhak and Rivka at the Be'er, nobody really knows if they're marrying their Ziva. And I think that the fact that you don't have access to whether it's even Rishon, Shani, any, not, that itself is a message from Hashem. This is not, you're going to get this right, ding, ding, ding. It's that you get married with the desire to invest in a building relationship to become the strongest couple you can be. And you will not have access to that information. Which I think in itself is very, very telling. So Bafloni Pony is what I tell people just to empower them that Hashem helps with this process. Since you don't have access to the information, it doesn't really affect your dating process at all. Anybody else? Yes, go ahead. Um, you said about like let's say someone the like, engagement's being broken, and sometimes it's like uh, they're panicking and they're just like nitpicking on things. So how do you know the difference is something a real issue? Okay. So the bottom line is we don't make decisions in an, in, a, in an accelerated emotional state. So when people tell me whether it's about the, the getting engaged or the staying engaged, I say the first thing you need to do is you need to treat the anxiety. And even if it's an understandable anxiety, we need to bring down the anxiety level and then we need to look at this not from a state of fight or flight, get me out of here. So, so I, I, that's the first thing I would do when, 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 when someone says, but, 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 but is he right for me? I'm like, we're not even answering that question yet. Because we're not answering that until you are very calm. And sometimes really the, the relationship is the issue. Very often it's not. Very often there's things that have to be worked on in this relationship, but it doesn't mean it's the wrong person. <coughs> we never solve a problem in a state of anxiety or, or depression or anything else. First, we're going to work on the regulation, and then we're going to try to figure out what's going on here. Yes, yes go ahead. What do you deal with a narcissistic personality disorder? They can't do the win-win, and you just, they can't hear you, and there's no 
parents. Okay, personality disorders are very, very difficult. I, you know, I didn't even get to the types of issues that really, really make for very challenging marriages. I mean, I'm gonna just throw it out there. I don't like to do this, but you know, I really give credit to a certain seminary in Israel. I could say Dr. Havina um, is a seminary that asked me to come speak to Shana Alev students about troubled marriages and what's, what's considered a regular marriage with that needs work and what's considered a really trouble. And it was, you know, it was hard for me to talk about this to 18 year olds, but I really appreciated the fact that they wanted an address. And I said something a little bit cliche-ish, and excuse the cliche, but I said that a lot of marriages need a certain kind of marriage therapy which kind of focuses on the potential, builds, you know, with a lot of optimism. I said, but then you have the three A's. You have addictions, adultery, and abuse. And those do not follow the same type of therapy. It's not, oh, tomorrow's going to be a better day. Let's go out for dinner. It's certain types of interventions. Some marriages do survive the three A's. Not all of them do, but some can. But that's a very different type of intervention than just the regular marriage therapy. And I would like to say that personality disorders doesn't fit in with the A's, but they're very, very difficult. And there are people who live alongside disordered people, and they, you know, they need a lot of hand-holding. They need a lot of support for any, you're talking about the narcissistic, the borderline. Is, there, some marriages are very, 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 very difficult. And again, sometimes they end up being terminated. And sometimes people get a lot of support to be able to live alongside such a person. But those are really complicated realities, and they're not, they're not going to follow the regular, the regular trajectory. So I agree. Yeah, win-win only works when somebody's willing to be able to compromise a little bit. And if they can't compromise, then that system is not going to work for them. And I, I must say, this is why I like to not be so judgmental, because we have, on one level, we have like that entitled, immature, not willing to work part of our community. And then on the other side, we have the fact that there's a lot of personality issues. It could be Gehenna to live with somebody with certain types of disorders. And we're not judging somebody who leaves a relationship because they're really married to a disordered person. In fact, some of them should have done it years ago. So we just have to be fair to the fact that we can't, you know, we have two almost opposite phenomena. Some where we're, we're really not enough efforts being put in, and some where we're like really, really challenged. So which one would work with them, if any? Well, I, for example, in Yushalayim, I have certain therapists who I know deal with personality disorders, and I tell them, the party who's married to the person to the person to go and get advice and to you know to get support. There are books that are written on being the spouse of let's say a borderline. There's a very famous book called Walking on Eggshells. Um, there's all kinds of narcissistic families, narcissistic mothers, narcissistic. There's a lot written on the topic. The person has to educate themselves and get a lot of advice about how to deal with it. So yeah, it's uh, I'm not going to say I can't say myself. I'm not the therapist. But, um, but it needs its own kind of intervention with somebody who's very familiar with personality disorders because it's really a little bit of a different situation. Okay. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this complicated, difficult topic. You're <laughs> incredible. Incredible.